Wyatt told me that I would be walking out to Michael Jackson, and I said, I don't know if I'll be able to keep myself from dancing, because it's Michael Jackson. But, well, good morning, Generations Church. So good to see all of your smiling faces, nerve-wracking, but good. And I want to welcome all those watching online. We're glad you can be with us no matter where you are. My name is Jeff, and we are kicking off a brand new series today called The Untold Story. Both Pastor Troy and Clay are out this week, and so they called me and said, Jeff, we want you to preach the first sermon in the new series. Okay, what's the series about? The Gospel of John. Oh, you, you want me to preach the opening sermon in what is arguably the heaviest most theologically dense and daunting book in the entire Bible? Yep, and we'll both be on vacation. Have fun. <laughs> awesome. So, I immediately felt like I was in over my head, which is why I did the only thing I could do, and I dove headfirst into the scriptures looking for answers. Let's start with some background. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the first four books in the New Testament. They're called the Gospels because they chronicle the events of Jesus' life and the things that Jesus said. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are often called the synoptic Gospels. Sin meaning same, optic meaning vision. They describe many of the same events, often in the same order, just from different perspectives. But John's Gospel is different. About 90% of what John recounts in his testimony is not found in the other three, and that's why we're calling this series The Untold Story. Now, while I was preparing this sermon, I, I had a question. Why are there four Gospels? Why not just one or two or 12, one from each apostle? The Old Testament contains many, many prophecies concerning what the coming Messiah will do but there are four primary prophecies concerning who the coming Messiah will be. I don't have enough time to give you an exhaustive list of all of the scriptures that make these prophecies, but I can give you two or three of the most succinct ones. We know from scripture that the coming Messiah will be the king of God's chosen people, descended from David. The Messiah will be the servant who suffers. The Messiah will be the son of man, meaning he will be fully human, and the Messiah will be the Son of God, meaning God himself. The Gospels are biographies and historical accounts, but more than that, they were each inspired and written to settle a specific argument about the identity of Jesus. In Matthew, we see the genealogy of Jesus that establishes his rightful claim as the King of the Jews. And, the, and the, the Magi from the East also declared Jesus the king of the Jews. Mark describes Jesus as a man of action who does God's will immediately as a good servant, all the way to suffering on the cross. In Luke's gospel, we see a different genealogy than the one in Matthew. This one goes all the way back to Adam, the first man, indicating that Jesus was fully human. Luke is also the only one that gives us details about Jesus' human birth. And John, John does more than all the others to reveal the deity of Jesus, showing him to be God in the flesh. Now, John explicitly says this is his purpose for writing his gospel. In chapter 20, verse 31, he says that he wrote his book so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. In other words, John is making the claim that the long-awaited Messiah has come. His name is Jesus, and everything we read in his gospel is evidence in support of that claim. John's intended audience was the Jews. He expected his readers to have knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. When we read his gospel, it might seem, to us at least, that he mentions certain things almost flippantly, but we have to remember that the Jews would have known exactly what he was talking about. They didn't need the additional explanation because they already had all the backstory. I'll do my best to point those things out. But along those lines, we have the benefit of already knowing that John was talking about Jesus, but the readers in the first and second centuries didn't. Sometimes when I read my Bible, I like to pretend that 
Christianity is a brand new thing and that I'm reading these words for the first time. I know I have this problem, but I suspect that many of you do as well. If I have read something a hundred times, then I wave my hand and say, yeah, I know. And I go about the rest of my day without giving it a second thought. But when I read something for the first time, I slow down, I dissect it, and I ask questions like, what does that mean? And what is this in reference to? God's word comes alive in spectacular ways when I do that. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're all going to pretend that we are first century Jews who know and accept the Old Testament, and we're going to read John chapter 1 as if it's the first time we've ever seen these words. Are you with me? Thumbs up. Let's do this. Verse 1. In the beginning. Deja vu. I've seen this before. This is an intentional reference to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The very first words of the entire Bible establish something very important about the nature of reality. The universe and everything in it had a beginning. But before that beginning, God already was. He did not come into being with the beginning, but rather he caused the beginning to, to happen. He had a reason to do it, which means he was already thinking, planning, and calculating. John opens his gospel in the exact same way. In the beginning, the word already was. Now that's word with a capital W, so we're not talking about language in general, but the word, the supreme word. The Greek word that he uses here is logos, and it means reason, the mental faculty of thinking, planning, and calculating. Sound familiar? The Word was with God and the Word was God. That's an interesting equivalence relationship. John is saying that the Word was with God, so they are separate entities, but also that the Word is God, so they are the same. Hmm. He was with God in the beginning. The pronoun he implies that this supreme word is a person. I wonder who he could be. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. The word is the reason why all things exist. The word is the cause and source of all creation. Well, we know from Genesis that God is the cause and source of all creation. So there is no ambiguity here. The person who is the word is also God. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. I want to take a closer look at two words, life and light. The Greek word for life is zoe, life of absolute fullness, both physical and spiritual, life eternal. And the Greek word for light is phos, knowledge of moral and spiritual truth and the, the, the purity associated with it. So, in other words, our eternal salvation comes exclusively from this supreme word. Well, now I really want to know who he is. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This is the same light that John mentioned in the previous verse, but now he's clearly saying that the word, who is God, is the light too. They're all the same person. This person is the embodiment of spiritual truth that brings eternal life. Now, if darkness is the opposite of light, then this darkness would be spiritual deception that brings eternal death. Without the light, there would be nothing but impenetrable darkness, nothing but death. However, the presence of the light destroys the darkness, and the darkness has no power to fight against it. Because we're talking about creation, I want to jump back to Genesis real quick because I'm fascinated by something. The very first words God was recorded to have spoken were, let there be light. Why did God create light first? I believe that the scientific significance of Genesis 1-3 is profound because light is energy. By creating light, God also created energy. The speed at which light propagates is bounded, which has a couple important consequences. First, 
It makes energy a usable commodity because light is able to interact with things. If light traveled infinitely fast, it wouldn't interact with anything. Energy would not be able to change states, and no physical process of any kind would occur. The universe would be nothing but impenetrable darkness. But second, speed is defined as a distance covered divided by elapsed time. So light interaction introduces time and measurements. By creating energy and limiting the speed of light, God created mass. When he created mass and enabled measurements, he created force. With mass and force comes gravity. With gravity comes stars and planets, the Earth. Our planet's gravity is the reason we maintain an atmosphere. Our atmosphere enables liquid water and life. <laughs> in short, all things that have ever existed in the universe owe their existence to light. Notice how the text in John mirrors this concept. The first thing that existed in the beginning was light, and that light made the rest of creation possible. The first five verses in John give us a different perspective on Genesis 1. When God said, let there be light, he was indeed saying, let there be energy that makes an entire universe possible. But in this context, he was also saying, let there be truth and eternal life. I am planning to make something spectacular. Humanity. They will be made in my image, and the light that I give will enable them to live with me forever. Let's keep going. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. God set John the Baptist apart to perform a duty, and that duty is found in a prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 3. A voice of one calling, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. John the Baptist was announcing the arrival of the Messiah. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. John the Baptist was important, but he wasn't the Messiah. Again, his mission was to announce the Messiah. And this was his message. The, the light, the, the person of truth that gives us eternal life, was about to be revealed, and not just to the Jews, but to everybody. John, you, you keep saying light and word and him, but you aren't telling us who this person is. Quit being a tease. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. John makes an incredible claim that the word, the light, that is, God was in the world. The, the Greek word for world used here specifically refers to the Gentiles, the people of non-Jewish faith. So, despite God himself appearing to the Gentiles, it seems they didn't notice because they didn't know him. They lacked the knowledge and the fellowship to be able to recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. This verse specifically refers to the Jews, and it carries a condemnatory tone because the Jews did know God. They had the knowledge and the fellowship to be able to recognize him, but when he appeared, they rejected him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. All was not lost, it would seem. Some people did receive the, the light into their hearts and minds, and they were fundamentally changed. They were born again unto God himself. Let's go back to verse 12. I, something caught my eye. This is the first time that John says the word and the light has a name, and that by believing in his name, we are given the right 
to become children of God. Not a possibility or a privilege, but a right. Possibilities are not guaranteed, and privileges can be revoked. But a right is assured. We have assurance because we are reborn into God's family, and God does not disown what is his. How do I know that? Because I cheated and I read ahead a little bit, but (laughs) you have to hear what he says in John chapter 8. The Messiah replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of of the family, but a son or daughter is part of the family forever. So if the Son of God sets you free, you are truly free. Let me get this straight. The word, the light, has a name. And if I believe in that name, I'm given an irrevocable spot in God's own family, and I can never be turned away? Seriously, John, tell us his name. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. If you compiled a list of the top 10 most profound verses in all the Bible, this would be number one. Let me explain. What is God? The same thing he has always been. Since eternity past, God has always been infinite, eternal, incorruptible, and immortal up in heaven. When God sent supernatural plagues against Egypt, that was incredible. When, when God created the universe out of absolutely nothing, that was unquestionably amazing. But in all cases, God was still infinite, eternal, incorruptible, and immortal up in heaven. Astonishing things have happened within creation, but because God is over and above creation, those things can't hold a candle to how awesome he is. But here in verse 14, John is telling us that God left heaven and became human. God became finite. When he was born, he was a specific length. He weighed a specific amount. He occupied a specific volume of space. God became temporary. This baby grew into a boy and then into a man. He aged. In John 7.33, he says, I am with you for only a short time. God became vulnerable. He was tempted to sin. God became mortal. At the end, he was pierced, he bled, and he died. Nothing, absolutely nothing, has ever happened in all of eternity that is more significant or profound than when the Word became flesh. And there's more to this verse. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John is testifying that he, as well as others, have witnessed enough evidence to become thoroughly convinced that this man who claims to be God, is the real deal. This man has proved himself true, and that is why they believe in him. The tension I'm feeling is out of control, John. Who is he? Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came. He's going to continue to tease us. The Greek word for fullness here is pleroma the riches and treasures contained in the cargo hold of a ship. Because God was so rich, he decided to come to us, literally to arrive at our shores in order to give us his treasure. The text says that we are given a new grace to replace the old one. John is declaring that the old covenant of the Mosaic law is being replaced by a new covenant in the Son of God. Okay, I swear, John, if you don't tell us his name, I'm going to knock all your teeth. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Finally! Oh, did it have to take 17 verses to get here? 
After taking his sweet time, John gives us the name. It's Jesus. Jesus is the word who was with God at the beginning. Jesus is the light who created all things. Jesus is the truth by which we have eternal life. Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus is God in the flesh. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. There's a lot of theology there. We see an echo of the equivalence relationship from verse 1. John says that the Son is God, but also distinct from God. But the real meat of this verse is up until this point in history, God has been inaccessible to humanity. There has been an insurmountable separation, but that changed when the Son, Jesus, became one of us. Because Jesus is God in the flesh, we have seen God for who he really is, and we can know God by knowing Jesus. Through him, we can enjoy the same kind of relationship with the Father that Jesus has, and that separation is no longer a permanent condition. Hallelujah. The first 18 verses make the claim loud and clear that the Messiah is Jesus and Jesus is the Son of God. But the only person talking up to this point has been John himself. This is where we could stand up and say, yeah, well, you know, that's just like your opinion, man and we would be right. Remember, we know what the Old Testament scriptures say. Deuteronomy 19.15, one witness is not enough. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. What John has written is certainly interesting, but we can't believe the testimony of only one person. John knew this as well, which is why he brought up John the Baptist. He was setting up the following passage beginning in verse 29. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me surpasses me because he was before me. What an intriguing thing to say. Did you notice that John the Baptist just referred to Jesus in all three verb tenses? He comes after me, future. He surpasses me, present. He was before me, past. I wonder what he means by that. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he, Jesus, might be revealed to Israel. So John the Baptist is summarizing his mission as given in Isaiah 40, verse 3, which we read earlier. And now what he said in the previous verse makes sense. The person who was prophesied to come in Isaiah was God himself. God is timeless, so talking about him in the past, present, and future all at once is appropriate. What, God, what uh, John the Baptist is saying here is that Jesus is God. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist repeats himself from the previous verse by confessing that he didn't know what the, the Messiah's name would be or what he would look like. And that's why he received a special instruction from God to look for a specific sign. When he saw that sign, he knew he had found the Son of God. I just have one question, though. Why a dove? Why not something more majestic? How much cooler would it have been if the spirit had come down as an eagle or a pterodactyl that perched on Jesus' outstretched arm, right? As is always the case with God, this was intentional. And to understand why, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 6. God warned Noah that he was about to pour out his wrath in the form of a great flood. The floodwaters covered the entire earth and killed everything that breathes. Only Noah, he, his immediate family, and the animals aboard his ark survived. In chapter 8, 
when the floodwaters receded, what did Noah do to check if it was safe to leave the ark? He sent a dove. That dove returned to Noah with a green olive leaf in its mouth, which was a powerful symbol for two reasons. First, it was evidence that God's wrath had been satisfied and there was now peace between God and humanity. Olive leaves were traditionally a symbol of peace, which meant that everyone and everything aboard the ark had been spared from God's wrath. They were now safe. But second, it was a promise of a new and better life. The ark was sufficient to preserve the lives of Noah, his family, and the animals, but they were never meant to live there forever. The leaf was tangible evidence that the earth was new, clean, and ready to sustain their needs in ways the ark never could. The Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, rested on Jesus to send two clear messages to us. First, Jesus is the means by which God will satisfy his wrath. If you receive Jesus, you will be spared from God's wrath and you will be at peace with God. But second, Jesus gives you a new and better life. Through him, we are given the right to become children of God. And as children of God, we will live in a world to come that is new, clean, and ready to sustain all of our needs in ways this world never could. Before we return to John the Baptist, I want to make a quick stop in Isaiah again. Chapter 42, verse 1, and you'll see why. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Now, let's see how John the Baptist concludes his testimony. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. With that, John the Baptist fulfills his mission to announce the arrival of the Messiah, the Son of God himself. But it also means that we have testimony from two witnesses. John's claim about Jesus is legitimate, and we can now evaluate it. In the interest of time, I do have to skip ahead, but I want to give you a quick summary of what happens next. Andrew was one of John the Baptist's disciples. Andrew heard John's testimony, just like we did, and he wanted to see if it was true. So he spent the day with Jesus. After spending that day with Jesus, Andrew was convinced. Andrew went to his brother Peter and told him everything. Peter came to Jesus to see if Andrew was being sincere or if Andrew was just being an idiot. And Peter became convinced as well. Philip followed Jesus because he believed, but Philip ran and told Nathanael. Nathanael initially doubted, but after meeting Jesus for himself, Nathanael believed too. What's so interesting about this is Jesus didn't gain his first followers because he preached a stunning sermon at the temple or because he performed miracles. Jesus gained his first followers because of the testimonies of other people. Here at Generations, we do baptisms and we have celebrate recovery. Testimonies are vital thing, are vital parts of both of those things for this reason. They're powerful stories about how Jesus changes lives and they help lead people to him. And as you can see, we now have six witnesses able to give testimony that Jesus is the son of God. However, there is one crucial question we haven't asked yet. It's possible that all six of these men were wrong. Perhaps they misunderstood. We have to go to the man himself. Who does Jesus say Jesus is? Verse 51. Jesus then added, I tell you the truth. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is a reference to Genesis chapter 28. Jacob had a vision where he saw angels walking up and down a stairway that stretched from the earth to heaven. God himself was at the top of the stairs speaking prophetically about the Messiah. He said that all people on earth will be blessed through Jacob's offspring. Now, that stairway was a direct, tangible connection between the earth and heaven that allowed people on earth to go up to heaven, but also heaven to come down to earth. Jesus is saying he is that stairway. He is heaven on earth. Through him, we can go to heaven. Jesus is saying that he 
is God in the flesh. And with Jesus' testimony about himself, that brings our witness count to seven. And John's claim is something that we must seriously consider. Human beings rarely make decisions in a vacuum. We make decisions based on the things we believe, and we believe based on evidence. As any good apologist will tell you, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. To say that Jesus is God is an extraordinary claim. And the goal of this series is to give you the extraordinary evidence required to believe it. As I said at the start, John wrote, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. In fact, in the very next chapter, John writes that it would be impossible to write down everything Jesus did and everything Jesus said and to explain the significance of all those things because there aren't enough books in the world to contain the words. But these, the specific events that John does write about in his book, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in Jesus, you will have life by the power of his name. John's gospel gives us sufficient evidence to make our decisions because it isn't just one guy's story, it's a peer-reviewed, independently verified historical account. Jesus is God is a conclusion that demands a response. You can't hear that statement and just ignore it. It requires you to make a decision. It is either true or false. You will either believe it or you won't. You've heard the testimony of multiple witnesses. They've told you who they think Jesus is. So, who do you believe Jesus is? If you're on the fence about Jesus, if you aren't sure if you want to believe or not, that's okay. You don't have to make that decision today. When Nathanael doubted what Philip told him, Philip challenged him to come and see for himself. I issue you the same challenge. Come back next week and the week after in order to see for yourself the evidence that John provides. If you thought that this small glimpse of Jesus was intriguing, then get ready for the untold story. You will see greater things than this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that your word is trustworthy. I thank you for the opportunity, as nerve-wracking as it is, to, to share your word. And I pray, Lord, that as we leave this place and go about the rest of our day, that you would give us a hunger and thirst for your word. Get us excited to come back and hear more from your word so that we can learn what Jesus came here to do, how he did it, and how we can believe in his name. I pray, Lord, that you would use that knowledge to instill within us a deeper connection with you. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus, the, the light that makes all things possible. Amen. <laughs>